every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on C-SPAN. Washington Journal continues. John Esposito is on your screen right now. He is an Islamic scholar and has a new book out called Unholy War, Terror in the Name of Islam. Dr. Esposito, in your book, you write about how the decision to send U.S. troops to Saudi Arabia during the Gulf War was a major turning point for Osama bin Laden. How carefully do you think yesterday's meeting in Crawford, Texas, between the Saudi Crown Prince and the President was being watched there? Oh, I think, I mean, I think very carefully. I think it's being watched throughout the Muslim world. Uh, I think there's a real concern. I just came back from the Middle East about a week, a week and a half ago. Uh, many people have uh, been asking, what is U.S. policy? Why does the U.S. seem to be adrift or contradicting itself? And I think the, uh, the potential ability of, let's say, uh, the Crown Prince, along with other significant Arab leaders, to work with President Bush, uh, many feel that's the only way out of what's going on right now. You rightly note that prior to September 11th, there was very little discussion of Islam in the United States. Since then, lots of long articles in newspapers, discussions on television. What contribution did you want to make with this book to that understanding? What I wanted to do is to try to frame um, the whole question of not just bin Laden, but uh, extremism, and to try to say, okay, how does this come about? What are the causes? What are the roots? Uh, how do we understand what's happening? But also, how does this differ from mainstream Islam and mainstream Islamic movements? In what sense can we call this an unholy war rather than a holy war? In what sense can we say this is a hijacking of Islam? Because I think for many people, they've been asking the question, is that really the case? Or is this really what Islam is about? Earlier in our program, I used a, uh, dis a dis statistic you give in the uh, toward the end of the book that, that uh, Islam is poised to become the second largest religion in the United States. Yeah. When will that happen? Uh, it'll happen probably within the next 20 years or so. I mean, in fact, uh, five years ago, um, people as diverse as Andy Rooney and I think Ted Koppel and others announced that it was. But I, I think uh, demographically, uh, Islam is not, Muslims are not quite there population wise, but they're very close. Would you add a little context to that statement? What's it really mean and what's it compared to? Well, it, it, you have a couple of things operating here. I think that. Um, there are 1.2 billion Muslims in the world, we all know that. What uh, some viewers may not be aware of if they're too young, regrettably people like myself are old enough to remember this. When I was growing up, Islam was invisible in the U.S. and Europe. Today it is the second or third largest religion. In terms of America, uh, there are, uh, the statistics vary, but approximately 7 million uh, Muslims. Um, and uh, you get different statistics with regard to the number of American Jews, but let's say 8 to 10. Uh, given the demographics, that is, uh, births among Muslims, uh, uh, the immigration that we've been having, um, it is entirely not only possible, probable, that within a short period of time there will be more American Muslims than there are uh, American Jews. And from watching that group of society right now, are they participants in the U.S. political process? They are, but there's been a debate uh, among American Muslims, as in a sense there's a debate with, um, uh, with uh, religious and ethnic minorities when they come here about issues of identity and assimilation and how far do you go and what, you know, what does it mean. Certainly this was a case for Roman Catholics. You know. In fact, non-Catholics raised the question, if you had a Roman Catholic president, um, would there be any contradictions between what he or she believed, you know, and their faith? And Muslims have been in that debate, but uh, they certainly have been participating in the system in the last elections. Many of them now kind of uh, rue the day that they uh, voted uh, for uh, President Bush. I mean, they were very involved in, in the elections in Florida and Michigan and other places. But there is a debate within the community about um, its, its role within uh, America. And there's a concern uh, right now about the erosion of uh, civil liberties. Well, could you go back to the, the, the future here and speculate uh, when Muslims become the second largest religion, what does that mean for the future of party politics and some of the decisions we're making right now on policy? Well, I think that Muslims will uh, divide uh, the way in which uh, other Americans and other American groups do. Uh, and in fact, uh, one could, uh, if you look at the last elections, one can see that if you look at the American Muslim vote, if I were generalizing, um, indigenous uh, Muslims, African Americans, tended to vote more Democratic. Immigrant Muslims tended to vote more Republican. And so I think depending on their uh, socioeconomic background and a lot of variables, it's not going to be a single block vote. On the other hand, on some issues that are of concern to Muslims, uh, it, it, is, it is very conceivable that they will uh, attempt to establish their own kind of uh, 
lobby influence uh, and group the way in which, uh, for example, American Jewish groups do. We're talking about uh, party politics and its effect on policy in the U.S., but John Esposito's book, Unholy War, is a primer on what's been happening in the past several decades uh, that has given rise to Islamic terrorists. We're going to open up our phone lines for your conversation with him. We welcome your input into the conversation or your questions for him. You can see the numbers below me on the screen divided by uh, party politics, and we'll go to calls in just a couple of minutes. Your book defines jihad. Would you define it for our viewers? Yeah, I think it's, it's a very important and central concept in Islam and in the Quran. Jihad, in its most basic meaning means to struggle, the effort to be a good Muslim, just as there's an effort to be a good Christian or a Jew, to, be, to lead a good moral life. Jihad also includes the notion that it's not only the duty, but the obligation of Muslims to defend themselves, their faith, their community, when under siege. So, in a sense, defensive war, or what we uh, sometimes refer to as just war. Uh, but what happens is that extremists can hijack the meaning of jihad and therefore engage in an un unfe offensive war or acts of terrorism and claim that what they're doing is defending Islam, which is precisely what Osama bin Laden and other extremists do. How does the West defend itself against this kind of fervor? I think that um, part of what it seems to me the West and the United States in particular has to do is to take a look at the root causes of terrorism. Indeed, the Secretary of State advocated that early on as, as, as we look to the future. We're never going to be able to do with global terrorism of any, of any form. Um, we, we've had terrorist attacks in other parts of the world. Um, and it's important to note that if you look at uh, State Department reports on acts of terrorism uh, over the last five years, in general, the Middle East or the Muslim world scores low rather than high. Uh, but I think that what we need to do is to attempt to limit the, the kind of seedbed from which uh, extremism grows and extremists are recruited. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, claim that if, if, in fact, the United States is successful in finding Osama bin Laden, there will be legions behind him? I think the way I would put it is that um, we're always going to have terrorists with us, whether they are in the Muslim world or any place else. And one of the things that I said um, a long time ago in my writing, uh, was not that Osama bin Laden wasn't a threat, but I, I had warned in a previous book called The Islamic Threat, Myth or Reality, not to make Osama bin Laden the poster boy, because what I was trying to say is there are other extremists out there, and if you simply focus on one personality, the fact is there are extremists out there, and it's going to be both, not only the job of, of the, the West, but of Muslim governments to attempt to address the issue of extremism within their own society. But that's going to mean that many of these authoritarian governments have to address issues of political repression, human rights, economic injustice. Have you had a chance to study the statement made by Zakarias Moussaoui in the federal court about why he was acting in his own defense and what he saw this case as being all about? Yeah. I saw some short excerpts uh, you know, about his, his characterization of our system and where he was coming from, um, you know, from religiously. I mean, what, what you see with people like Moussaoui, if you study, I mean, I've looked at uh, Muslim, Jewish, and Christian, for example, extremism. Um, and in fact, teach, teach a course that deals with that. Extremists tend to use their religion in a very careful way. They will take a text out of their scriptures, and then they will simply manipulate that text, uh, or that worldview, if you will, to legitimate what they're doing. And, and, and we'll see that consistently. Uh, the bin Laden uh, speeches in particular, when you look at them, are really, uh, they're almost, they're diabolical, but they're almost masterful in the way in which they actually hijack uh, uh, their religious text in order to legitimate their agenda. Before we go to calls, I wonder if you might uh, directly respond to a caller who was, was talking to us just as you were coming in. And he said that essentially the analysts have it all wrong with regard to the Middle East and the question of Islam, that it's never been about religion, it's always been about nationalism. I think that national impl nationalism plays a very significant role. For example, when people talk about Hamas, uh, and its role. Yes, it's a religious group, but Hamas is primarily concerned about Palestinian nationalism. And most of the, the, uh, the battles within Muslim societies that were fought, let's say, by secular opposition groups in the past, uh, are today fought by religious uh, opposition groups. Yes, they may say they want a more Islamic state, but they're primarily concerned about that state, that nation. Then they have an international vision, but primarily they're focused on what's going on within their specific country. But this would not apply to Al-Qaeda? It, it, it does and it doesn't. Many of the groups that belong to Al-Qaeda primarily began addressing their nation, continue to be primarily concerned with their nation, but will come together 
on uh, common international sort of agendas or objectives, especially the extent to which countries like the U.S. or the West are seen as part of the problem, not the solution, in their region. Dr. Esposito, based at Georgetown University, he directs the Center for Christian Muslim Understanding. By the way, what's your own religious background? Uh, Roman Catholic. And he is the author of many books, his latest published by Oxford Press called Unholy War, Terror in the Name of Islam, and we are going to co phone calls for him. First up is a call from uh, Indianapolis. You are on the air. Good morning, Mr. Esposito. Good morning. Um, I uh, have uh, some uh, four points to make uh, to you about this uh, unholy war that you all, everybody talks about. Uh, actually, when they say infidels, when the Muslims say infidels, they mean everybody that don't believe in God, or whether you're a Catholic, a Jew, or a Muslim. You're an infidel if you don't believe in God. The jihad, point number two, jihad. When uh, God uh, told Noah to build that ship and he destroyed the world, did, uh, is he going to be considered a terrorist? Or what about the two angels he sent to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Are they terrorists too? And point number three, Christians, Muslims, and good Jews, because there are good Jews. Uh, the bad Jews uh, are uh, mentioned in the Bible. Now, I'm a Christian. I believe in what the Bible says. Bad Jews uh, were the ones that slandered and lied about Jesus and turned him over to have him murdered uh, to the Romans. And point number four is, uh, in the Bible, these people come from Ur. Ur, if you look in Genesis, if you look on the map, it comes from Iraq, along the border, I mean, along the uh, uh, Euphrates. And the, uh, so these people traveled from Ur because God chose them, and they moved up into, uh, they, they followed the, the, the biblical line. But what it says in the Bible, they went up in, and they settled in Palestine. Now, Palestine was already settled. All right, caller, I'm going to stop you. Get, given us a lot of uh, very diverse topics here, and I'm going to ask if you can sort of tie this all together for us. Yeah, I, I think that the basic category, belief and unbelief or infidel, uh, all faiths uh, historically identified themselves in terms of the, their faith versus the other faith, and, and you have rough categories along those lines. Uh, uh, so I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure where we are there. Um, with regard to uh, jihad, I'm not sure what the issue would be. Um, talking about good Jews, bad Jews, there were good Christians, bad Christians, um, so I, I'm not sure the issue there. And with regard to uh, uh, Ur being in Iraq, uh, yes, that's, that's, that's correct. While we're defining terms, I'm going to go to a, a, another definition of terms used in the, some of the post-analysis in the Crawford, Texas meeting. Uh, this is from uh, the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer. Bush urged the de facto Saudi leadership to speak out against Palestinian suicide bombings and question him about a recent government-sponsored telephone ra raising $100 million for Palestinian martyrs, and that's the key word. Uh, it says that Abdullah assured Bush that the money would not be used to reward terrorist attacks. Here's the quote. The term martyrs in Saudi Arabia refers to victims of Israeli aggression, according to a Saudi spokesman. None of that money goes to terrorist organization. To the origin of the word martyr. The word martyr uh, uh, comes from the, the term shaheed, which means one who is a witness for one's faith. So it means somebody who dies for their faith. Uh, the term tends to be used very generally within uh, Islam, certainly today in the Muslim world, for anybody who dies for their faith, but actually for some who act, uh, die for national movements, but in other words, who die for a good cause. Um, so I think that, you know, that's there. I think that the, uh, the Saudi fundraiser, uh, the Saudis have made very clear that that funding was to support um, uh, those uh, families uh, who, who lost uh, someone in the war. Uh, part of the concern is whether or not some of that money will go uh, to, to Hamas, uh, to a group that's on our, on, on our terrorism list. I think, on the other hand, I think the American government has to be very careful about the way in which it, it, it uh, handles uh, Abdullah or the Saudi people. Uh, you know, they've raised money uh, to support a cause. Uh, and that's fine if, if we want to look into that, but then we have to be willing to raise the same questions about other groups that raise money for, for example, uh, uh, Israelis who are killed. Uh, otherwise, if we don't do that, Bush suffers from the problem he's had throughout the last few months. There's no parity of rhetoric and policy. It's a lopsided approach. For Dr. John Esposito, next, Franklin Furness, Ohio. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I think a point that doesn't get made very often in the media is the fact that uh, the Muslim religion was uh, 
for the most part, spread by force, uh, by violence. Uh, Muhammad himself uh, did a lot in the way of conquest, and uh, the point gets made a lot that uh, jihad is not a term of actual uh, conflict or warfare, but rather a personal struggle. And uh, I think that uh, Muhammad's life uh, exemplifies the fact that uh, the Muslim religion has always been uh, about uh, violence and uh, actual force and you know the first hundred years or so of uh, the existence of uh, the Muslim religion uh, it was spread throughout the, the region uh, mostly by force and I think that point really rarely gets mentioned. Thank you. Um, I hate to say it but you're simply inaccurate. Um, the fact is that yes the Islamic Empire did spread uh, and it was spread by rulers and with uh, with uh, military but the religion itself was not spread primarily by force. Um, when you talk about the example of Muhammad, uh, in fact, if you actually take a look at, for example, Karen Armstrong's biography of Muhammad and there are others, you'll get much more of a sense that, uh, of the role that Muhammad uh, played. Um, uh, there was no doubt that Muslims responded to, to force or to a threat uh, because they had the right to also um, uh, defend themselves and use force. Muslims are not to told to turn the other cheek, for example, by the Quran. Um, so I think that one wants to distinguish between spreading one's religion and the way in which, uh, for example, imperial states were spread. Uh, and, and that was the way in which states uh, spread at that time. Uh, Eastern uh, Byzantine Empire, which was Christian, did the same thing. When you uh, help people in your book understand the difference between the religions, uh, you write that, th that Islam is in some ways closer to Judaism in that it is a religion of action as opposed to Christianity or religion of belief. Will you explain that? Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. When I first got into the field, I was asked to be in a Christian-Muslim-Jewish dialogue. Uh, and so I asked who the Muslim was going to be, and they said that I was. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not a Muslim. This was in the Boston area. It gives you an idea of how bad things were in terms of uh, spokespersons when, people. When was this? This was the early 70s. And they said that they'd like me to be the Muslim. Well, uh, there was a rabbi and there was a priest. Um, parenthetically, I wound up squaring off more with the priest. Uh, but after it, the rabbi came up to me and he said, uh, I have a bone to pick with you. And we had had a very good conversation. I thought, oh, geez, you know, what could this be? We hadn't discussed the Arab-Israeli issue, etc. And he looked at me and said, you know, Islam is so close to Judaism, I didn't feel I had much to say in the way we were going back and forth. What I mean is, is that in Islam and Judaism, the emphasis is on action. So we talk about an observant Jew and an observant Muslim, and therefore law plays the central role, it's the central discipline in Judaism and Islam, and also both emphasize an absolute monotheism. Christianity uh, emphasizes doctrine or dogma, what you believe. Not that it downplays action, but it's what you believe. And of course, from a Jewish and a Muslim point of view, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, is a kind of compromising of the absolute monotheism uh, you know, of God. So that's what I meant about there are really closer parallels. Well then, take that analysis and apply it to the problem with Israel and Palestine. You've got two people whose cultures are based on action for faith in one geographic yeah. area. The problem of Palestine, though, is primarily a problem about land and politics. It, religion can then come to play a role in terms of claims. But the reality of it is, this, this is really all about land, and it is a political issue, it is a nationalist issue. Uh, what, what you have people talking about today is the desire for a Palestinian nation alongside an Israeli nation. It is true that within both are religious traditions and people who uh, see their claim to the land as religiously rooted, and that, that creates the religious dimension of the problem. For John Esposito, next, Detroit. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I just got two issues I'd like to possibly get a comment from your guest on. One is that, having lived in Europe for many years, um, a lot of my Muslim friends, one of their things, they'll tell you that the difference between the Judo-Christian you know, belief system and the Muslim belief system is a, to is a separation of church and state. I mean, the Judo-Christian belief, there is a, it's even in the Bible, a solid separation between church and state. And most of my Muslim friends who are very devout will sit there and tell you that the church and the state, church meaning the Muslim faith, are the same. Now, if you put that in context with the, as, as I agree with you, the rising numbers of Muslims in the country, I mean, here in Detroit, we've supposedly had the largest Arabic population outside the Middle East sitting down in Dearborn. And if they start to take a real, you know, part in our political system, that's going to be real interesting and real scary to what 
what could possibly happen in this country. Maybe not a change of government, but the, I mean, but the rest of us who are non-Muslims, you know, we would start, I would imagine I could see a real war coming between, you know, the Judeo-Christian people and, the, and Islam. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just a quick observation uh, to begin with. Historically, you know, we talk about Christianity talking about render to Caesar and render to God. Well, the fact is, once Christendom um, became a part of uh, empire, became part of, of an imperial setup, there was a close relationship between religion and the state. Never, never joined. Also, historically, if you read your Hebrew Bible, I mean, in fact, Judaism expressed itself um, with, within um, if you will, uh, monarchies and, and, and empires. Uh, later history, uh, uh, Jews were not in a position to have that kind of political relationship. And both traditions in, in, in the modern period have moved into a more secular mode, if you will. Within Islam, historically, there's been a close relationship between religion and the state. And there are Muslims who believe that that relationship should exist. More often than not, they're talking about what ought to be going on within their own Muslim countries. But even within Muslim societies, there's a debate about what it means. Should religion just inform the state in terms of its values, or are you talking about a formal Islamic state? So there's a real debate within Muslims in those communities. In terms of Muslim minorities in America and Europe, that's a different ballgame. It, and it's similar to Roman Catholics. I mean, historically, when Roman Catholics came here, it was a time when within Roman Catholicism, there was a belief that uh, where there was a majority, uh, there should be uh, heavy Roman Catholic influence, as in Spain and Portugal. But for minorities in America, there, there was the acceptance of a redefinition of the relationship of their religious tradition to the state. And I think the same thing is true for, uh, for Muslims in America. Arlington, Virginia, good morning. Hi, Dr. Esposito. I was wondering, I read uh, Gene Genevieve Abdu's book, No God But God, where she addresses the differences between um, militant Islam and um, Islamists who want to create a civil society, say in Egypt, she claims that um, the sort of popular Islamic movement is more dangerous than the militants. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Jenny doesn't claim that the popular are more dangerous. She claims that, in fact, um, the, the militants are a radical minority and that despite what the state does, that um, at, a, at a popular level, that is, uh, those uh, Muslims and, and Muslim organizations in civil society that run schools and daycare centers, et cetera, uh, and, and banks, that religion is becoming from the bottom up more of a factor in society. The reason I'm aware of this is that um, if you look at the book, I'm pretty sure you'll see a rather long blurb uh, in which I praise the book. I know the book quite well. So her distinction is, is to basically say even if the state crushes uh, any form of, uh, of political Islam within Egyptian society today, religion has become more of a factor, and she doesn't see that as a, a threat other than a threat to an authoritarian regime. Next call is from Germantown, Maryland. You're on for John Esposito. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Doctor. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, I, I have uh, three children, and uh, my wife and I live in a house in and, and Germantown, and, uh, and I know that we send Israel $4.5 billion a year, and uh, they have approximately 4.5 million people, or 4.5 million people. Uh, that comes down to $10,000 per man, woman, and child. Uh, I'd love to receive a check for $50,000 in my mailbox every year. Uh, I, that's a lot of money, and I'm sure we give away a lot of money to other di different countries uh, in that area, including the Saudis, because we buy their oil. Uh, we have... Uh, supported the whole Middle East uh, throughout this whole, well, the past century. Uh, and uh, I'm I just wondering, uh, you know, with, with everything going on there, uh, if we go to war next time, maybe we should just be prepared to stay and make it a territory and then eventually turn it into a state. Isn't that what normally happens uh, when people go to war? Germantown, thanks. I think one of the great uh, concerns that I would have today is that we, uh, that America not be perceived as the new imperial power. Uh, I think that America has to operate much more multilaterally than unilaterally, and we haven't been doing that. President Bush tends to announce a policy and then basically uh, say, well, we expect our allies uh, in the Arab and Muslim world or in Europe to come along with us. And that's resented around the world, not just in the Arab and Muslim world. With regard to the aid, aid side of things, well, we don't have time to get into that, but the thing that I would say, and one of my concerns throughout the current conflict, is I think the United States, since we do give significant aid to Israel and Egypt, should be using that leverage, both with Arafat and Sharon, 
again, a parody. And in fact, this administration has not done that effectively. If you look at the front page of the Washington Post today, it actually has a story talking about what everybody in Washington has known, that there is a, a real split and a dif and difference between the State Department and the Defense Department. And I think that the State Department has the right fix. Regrettably, Mr. Bush has been listening to his, his Defense Department. The other story on the front page of the paper this morning, this is the Washington Times, is that the administration is very close to making its decision about Iraq. Uh, and what are your concerns as that decision nears? <laughs> My concerns are that it would be a disaster. I think that... Um, a couple of things. I think even, even before the current crisis in the Arab-Israeli, uh, there were many of us who were saying, look, first address the Iraqi sanctions and what's happening to the Iraqi people. Then you have some credibility when you want to move on to talk about going after Saddam. And when you go after him, make sure you have a good coalition. The fact is, most of our Arab allies, Jordan, Egypt and Saudi Arabia have basically said this would be a disaster now. Most of our European allies are not happy with this at all. Even Mr. Blair, who supported it, his own party, has excoriated him for it. To move against Iraq, if we were to do that, in the midst of a time when we're uh, not moving effectively and when there's, there's the danger of an explosion over the Arab-Israeli, a spillover in terms of that explosion, to then move against Iraq, I think, would be the worst possible thing. As, as I like to put it, I sometimes wonder whether or not Mr. Gore has planted one of his operatives as an advisor for Mr. Bush in terms of the way in which the Bush administration at times, from a public relations point of view, let alone a policy point of view, seems to be calling the shots wrong. Next call for you, <clears throat> excuse me, is from Winchester, Virginia. Go ahead. You there, caller? Yes, uh, hi. Uh, I'm a Christian uh, Palestinian, and uh, my parents were uh, expelled uh, from uh, their uh, village, uh, Baram, in 1948. The Israeli soldiers told them that uh, you Christians don't belong to this land, uh, go out of here, and millions of uh, others have been expelled. I want uh, Dr. Esfacito to tell me where in the Bible or the Old Testament it says that this land belongs to the Jews. I know that uh, God has um, uh, promised uh, Abraham, who is the father of all faith, the Jews, and he had Ishmael and uh, Isaac, and we all come from them. So where does, uh, why did the Israelis uh, or Jews claim Abraham as their prophet, and, and thus the land belongs to them? That's what I would like to uh, understand. Thank you. Thanks very much for your question. First of all, I think that uh, it's important to point out to viewers that your voice is, is significant here. A lot of people simply think that when one talks about Palestinians, one is talking about Muslims, when in fact you have a significant Christian minority. And, me and, and many of their uh, fellow Christians in the States aren't even aware of that. Uh, in terms of the claim, the, you can, if you look at the Hebrew Bible, you, you have a covenant between uh, God and the Jewish people and the land. But remember that for Christians, there then is a subsequent covenant between God and Christians, and for Muslims, there is then a next covenant between God. So the argument over scriptural covenant is, is a difficult one to make other than for one's own community. And part of the problem that we have now is that, in fact, you have three faiths that, for example, have religious claims on Jerusalem. And I think that needs to be realized, that it's, it's not, you know, one faith that has a sole claim, but you, you have three faiths in terms of international politics. Uh, and I think that that's also at the heart of uh, the, the current crisis that we're seeing. Dr. Esposito, what took you down this path for your own career? Uh, it, it's incredible. I, I uh, Very briefly, because I have a very strange life, uh, I've been married 36 years. In another life, as I put it, I was in a monastery for 10 years. Then I went to graduate school, and I had done a degree in Catholic theology, and I became interested in Hinduism and Buddhism. The chairman of the department, when I wanted to finish a PhD in Hinduism, said, we're hiring Muslim scholars, you need to study Islam. Well, all I knew were the stereotypes of Arabs and Muslims. So what I knew didn't make me feel like I wanted to even spend a course, let alone major on it. And I said no. He, and it was interesting, the chairman was Jewish. He pressured me to take a course. Being a pragmatic ethnic and wanting to finish my degree, I agreed. 
And then I just, uh, I was just stunned because I suddenly was studying a tradition and I thought to myself, wait a minute, there's a Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. I always thought Islam was over there with Hinduism and Buddhism. And so I began to see the linkages and I, and I backed into the field. So there's more of a linkage between these three major religions than there is between Buddhism. Absolutely. I mean, they are children of Abraham. They, they have uh, common uh, theological sources. All three believe in God, prophets, revelation accountability. Uh, so th there's a tremendous, there are differences, significant differences, but there is this kind of shared tradition that we are not raised with and we don't emphasize enough. And when did Georgetown, a Jesuit Catholic university, see fit to have a Christian Muslim center? Well, actually in, uh, in 1993, uh, the university uh, in partnership with a foundation uh, decided to uh, establish uh, the center there to deal with the relationship of the Muslim world in the West, or as I like to put it, Islam and the West and Islam in the West. Post Gulf War? Yes. Next is a call from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all doing? We're doing fine, sir. Um, a few uh, comments that I would like to make, I don't think they would require any answer, but just a, a, a good study by Mr. Esposito. First of all, um, in the nation of Israel, um, geographically, it's, it's kind of amazing that that tract of land, which is uh, relatively about the half the size of South Dakota, um, commands and has so much of the world's attention on that land and the people. And if you go and study out in the Bible, and I'm talking about my King James Bible, which I've studied it um, in terms of the, the geographical people there, um, God, which there is only one God, by the way. I am Christian, and um, if you're a Christian, you are identified with Christ, um, not just because of some religious name that you would like to uh, put on it, but a Christian is a person that believes in one God. Um, the well, caller, let me bring you back to your, your first point, which was that that geographic area has commanded so much of the world's attention. Where are you going with that thought? Well, it, it's it's origination is because of God there in in that land and that's where um, so much of the world's attention is focused on that little tract of land I mean we've got the United States here which is just huge in terms of, of land mass and all of the people in this land right now in the United States has uh, you, you talk about so many religions there but the basic religion or the basic people that has so much focus on it is the Jews, and that's because of God. Of, All right, of well, let's hear what John Esposito has to say about that. Well, I, I think what I would say is that you're a one-third right. You're one-third correct. The fact is that that land ha has given birth to the three uh, great monotheistic uh, traditions, uh, among others, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And so you have, therefore, um, common and, and in a, at times competing claims. Uh, but the second reason why that area gets a disproportionate amount of attention, and I would say it's the first reason politically, is O-I-L, O-I-L. It's oil. I mean, that's a simple reality. And part of the, the issue now is, in terms of, for example, the pressing of U.S. policy, how much of it is being driven by our concern about oil in the Middle East and oil in Central Asia, protecting that, having our forces there and putting our bases there. Well, the flip side of that question, and you just took me to the area I wanted to go, which was how important is OIL in the rise of the, uh, the, the terrorists like Osama bin Laden? I think that the whole, uh, you know, I mean, clearly the oil issue, uh, you know, is a major issue. It, 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 is, it is what caused the United States to be primarily concerned after the Gulf War. But also provided to put its, the funds? To put its troops there. And, and also, uh, you... Obvious, obviously, to the extent that the funds come from that region, a good deal of the, of, of the wealth is, is oil wealth. Next is Cody, West Virginia. Good morning. Good morning. Hello? Yes, go ahead. In my opinion, I think religion has done more harm than it's ever done any good. That's all I have to say. Great. Can I, I'd like to comment on that uh, because... Um, you know, the way I would put it is as follows. Um, religion has two sides to it. And it, this has been true historically and it's true today. On the one hand, it, it has this enormous ability to provide a map of reality, 
a sense of ultimate meaning. It answers all the big questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What should I be doing? Where am I going? It brings about uh, uh, the ability of self-transcendence. On the other side, on the other hand, historically, religion has always had its dark side. That very power of religion uh, can be used and abused by people, and it's been done in the past, and it continues to be done uh, today around the world. And I think that's what we have to keep in mind, and that's what we have to address. Our Friday morning program is being carried internationally by WorldNet. Our next phone call comes from Bangladesh. You are on the air. Hi. Uh, I was going to ask a question to Mr. Joseph. I believe it's Joseph, right? John. Oh, okay. How are you? It's all right. Hi. Uh, I was wondering that you know, in American media, all this New York Times and Post or whatever it is, and uh, LA Times, all these newspapers, this shows in the picture from Palestine, like when MN, Israeli soldier died, it's a big sin. One Israeli Jew died, it's a big sin on the front page. When there is a five children dying by Israeli soldier, but there is no front page headline, what, what, what is the issue? Even though MSNBC, CNN, and nightly news, Tom Brokaw, and what, Dan Rather, they, those people always they talk about Jewish people, and, and this shows all these things that, you know, now, suicide bomber is doing to the Israelis, limited amount of people. What about this Janine Massacre? What about the Nablas, Ramallah? I, I never seen these things with headline on this, uh, what do you call, in uh, Nightly News, War News, or Post Times. What's the story about it? That's, a, that's an excellent question. The first, the first observation I would make is that there is not a parity of coverage. Uh, when, when the coverage is there, there's no equal coverage of both sides. The fact is, I just did an interview yesterday with, uh, with a European station. If you look at European coverage of this war compared to American, it's like night and day. Uh, and part of the problem is, there are, there are a variety of reasons. It's not only what, what domestic pressures are there that influence uh, the American media. Part of the problem is that the American media doesn't have access the Israelis have kept out any significant access in terms of the, the American media. So, in a sense, we don't, we don't see equally the images. One of the points that I make is that they see more than we see. That is, people in the Arab and Muslim world, because of Al Jazeera and their own medias that have developed in the last 10 years, every day when they're having a cup of coffee can watch live what's happening uh, in Israel-Palestine in the conflict. And they see the, the violence and terror that are committed by both sides. Too often here, the American people uh, see and have an unbalanced uh, coverage of, of what's actually taking place on the ground. And in a related question, over the past decade, has the uh, more widespread availability of uh, U.S. television, such as CNN, in Muslim countries contributed to this uh, schism between our cultures? I think that, you know, coverage by CNN and, and BBC, the, it, it's not so much that they contribute to it, it's, 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 it's the policies that they're covering that contribute to it. I'm thinking about entertainment television. Oh, I think, I think when you talk about the entertainment and cultural side, uh, that, that's an issue. Uh, but, you know, when you think about it, the French think we're cultural terrorists and worry about globalization for that reason. Uh, and I think that's something we need to think about. Indianapolis, good morning. You're on the air. Good morning. A uh, Palestinian Christian woman called a minute ago and asked Professor Esposito, where in the Bible would it talk about these things? Uh, I could read you one verse, Genesis 25, 6. But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. So the Palestinians are supposed to live on the east bank of the Jordan, and that's been true ever since they split up the country of Transjordan into Jordan and to Israel. And there's no living with peace in Surah, um, uh, let's see, Surah, 533, the punishment of those in the Quran who wage war against Allah and his apostle Muhammad, they should be murdered or crucified, or their hands and feet should be cut off on opposite sides, or they should be imprisoned. In other words, for the Jews to exist there, and I've been studying the Bible as the Word of God. I, I think a lot of Catholics don't really study the Bible. For 30 years, I've been studying the Quran and I'm known Muslims. It's just, it's just a, a, a poke in the apple of the eye of the Islam for them to even exist there, because Islam has always been a world-conquering religion ever since Muhammad.
John, uh, John Esposito, answer? Yeah, I really think that you might, uh, A, you might want to read the Quran a little bit more carefully. You might want to even take a look at my book because I discussed that. You, uh, the passages that you have there, uh, some, pa some passages do exist, what are called the sword verses, but they're responding to specific situations. On the other hand, you have many other verses that talk about the fact that you fight those that attack you. As soon as they stop attacking, you stop fighting. I would suggest if you want to read your Bible correctly, that you take a look at Genesis 34 and that you look at uh, sections of Isaiah, of Kings, etc., and look for those passages uh, that you will find, uh, in fact, uh, reek of a, um, of a holy war tradition. The, the tradition of holy war exists in all three faiths. The question is whether or not those wars are fought for just or unjust reasons. But the notion of holy war exists in all three faiths. Our next phone call, Dubai in the UAE. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. I have a question for Dr. Esposito. Before you continue, uh, sir, could I have you please mute the volume on your TV? It's causing feedback. Yes. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Esposito. I want to uh, know if, why is it that everybody turns a blind eye to their own religion? For example, if uh, the so-called pundits and uh, so-called experts try to generalize Islam as a religion of terror and war, uh, why don't they say Christianity and Catholicism is a religion of child molestation and pedophilia? And, uh, Before uh, Dr. Esposito answers, could you tell us a bit about your view of the meeting between President Bush and the Saudi Crown Prince yesterday? Yes, my uh, personal view is that uh, it seems like the U.S. can bully the Arab countries more, of course, than they can Israel. Uh, they have either greater leverage uh, or greater interest with Israel. Uh, you know, it's this is, as Dr. Esposito put it, I think, uh, very distinctly, it's not about religion. This is about land. This is about a country who is undergoing apartheid, like South Africa, but there is no cry for, for that. And uh, I hope that, you know, some good can come out of the meeting and some peace can come into the region. Thank you. Um, let me uh, address that very, very quickly. It the heart of the problem that you identify, and it's, it's very much there, is that what people tend to do is they compare their ideal to somebody else's reality. And what we need to do is to say, okay, what are the ideals in our faiths? And then what are the realities in our faiths? The same thing is true of nations. Uh, when people want to talk about America and compare it to other countries, what we Americans naturally do is to talk about what our principles are, but not, let's say, what the warts or our dark side are, but we compare our principles to another nation. Uh, and we do that all the time. We do it on issues even, for example, with regard to women. We'll talk about uh, the abuse of women in other societies very freely, but we'll act as if we don't have major problems with that in our own society. And your last point, to address that very briefly, is I think that it's fine for the president to press uh, Abdullah or other Arab leaders. But again, there has to be a parity. That same kind of language should be used to press Mr. Sharon. In effect, what the president needs to be saying to Arafat and Sharon is, you're not just both part of the solution, you're both part of the problem. Would you pick up the issue of women in Muslim societies and how this increased attention might affect their fate? I think that the, the issue of, of um, uh, women in Muslim societies uh, has to be understood and we still don't you know, quite get it. Uh, women in Muslim societies their condition is very diverse in terms of, for example, dress, ability to work, to get an education. We tend to simply see women uh, in Muslim societies in terms of the dominance of, let's say, what the Taliban did, which uh, is not representative of most Muslim societies, or with regard to, let's say, the relationship of men and women in public space, we uh, see it in terms of women in Saudi Arabia, when in fact you have a completely different situation in Southeast Asia and in Egypt. Uh, I think that the, the real challenge in Muslim societies is to move beyond patriarchy, just as uh, Christianity and Judaism had to do that. All three faiths began in patriarchal societies, and it was the boys who interpreted the faith and said what it meant in terms of gender relations. And I think reform means addressing not just the hardcore issue of religion, but rather the fact that religion was often used to legitimate patriarchal practices. Northport, Florida, Democrats line. Yes, hi, good morning. Uh, 
Thank you for C-SPAN. Uh, Mr. Esposito, Esposito, I'm sorry, uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Um, excellent point from the host. And going back to the last international caller, they should represent America as the administration, not America as a whole. This administration, in my opinion, has a uh, deep uh, revenge set on uh, setting a few scores. And uh, they definitely need to, to leave Iraq and the Arabs alone and deal with them more rationally um, on holy war. Uh, that's an excellent um, title. Um, <clears throat> unholy, yeah, for what they did, for sure. Um, and uh, there's no uh, excuse for that. And uh, there should be more rational means of uh, dealing with uh, acts like that and people like that. And, um, you know, uh, the, the land issue with Israel, in my opinion, um, this land is your land, this land is my land, you know, that's a great song. But, I mean, it's getting a lot of people killed, and uh, we're, we're pouring billions of dollars into a country that's bullying other people around, which I think is a ploy. I think they're trying to talk us in here. They're trying to get us in. It pushes me a little conservative, you know, on, on not making sure that we get in knee deep. But he's centering too much attention on Iraq. And, you know, that's over and done with. We didn't finish the score. We should need leave them alone and um, deal with the matters at hand. And the matters at hand is what happened to our Pentagon and what happened to the World Trade Center and what, what might happen. And um, I'll let you uh, uh, comment. Thank you. Those are excellent uh, observations. Uh, first of all, I think that this is a, a real concern, whether or not there is an attempt to settle scores uh, with regard to Iraq, with regard to Somalia. So this becomes a time to clean up the danger of this, it, particularly if there isn't a multilateral approach in which we bring along our allies, is that the United States winds up looking as if it's the new imperial power that feels that it, it has a right to redraw the map of the Middle East. With regard to the, the issue of uh, unholy war, Part of what I wanted to say is, look, we've got to root out terrorism. We've got to attempt to limit and contain it. But we can't brush stroke the religion of Islam. We don't do that with Judaism and Christianity. When an extremist kills Rabin, or when a Christian extremist blows up an abortion clinic, nobody says, there go those Jews and Christians again. We instinctively distinguish between those who hijack their religion and the mainstream tradition. That's what we need to do about Islam uh, and Muslims. New York City, you're on the air. Good morning. Um, I'd like to uh, um, congratulate the previous caller because I agree with everything that he said. I'd like to also make a comment. I'd like to ask a question to make a comment. Um, uh, Mr. Esposito, you mentioned just, just before the previous caller uh, about the, that the Bible was essentially written by males. Um, there were, I'm not a student of the Bible, but perhaps you could comment on this. Um, my question is this. Uh, who decided, I mean, who actually decided which books were going to be included in the New Testament? And um, uh, I think that we need to start looking at the Bible, and I don't mean any disrespect. I grew up as an, as an Eastern Orthodox uh, Christian, and I grew up in a very religious home, so I don't mean any disrespect. But I think we need to start perhaps viewing the Bible also as a, uh, the way we would view any other historical document and uh, consider that a lot of it, a lot of the interpretation was a result of political, uh, political interests. And I would like to make one more comment, if I may. Um, as far as the, um, I, I don't know if you could comment on this because I tuned in a little late. As far as it uh, regards the Palestinians and the Israelis, I have a real problem with this. And I would like a, a question answered. Um, I don't know why uh, we see, particularly in the American media, the incredible, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost manic to try to equate the two parties. Uh, we have, on the one hand, a group of people who basically have no, I mean, they have no army. So essentially, they cannot even be considered combatants, okay? They're essentially freedom fighters. And then we have another army armed to the teeth. And so I, could you possibly comment on the legality of that? I mean, these are occupied territories, and yet we have Israel making, and Sharon making all the decisions regarding even, even international aid. Fuller, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, what I was saying is that the religious traditions are inter have been interpreted by males. Your theologians, your, your rabbis, your ulama, or religious scholars in Islam historically were all males in patriarchal societies applying the norms of scripture 
to social realities and defining what the law and doctrine was. In terms of the New Testament, you're right, the books that are in there were determined by church councils, and there were books that were left out that, 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 that could have made it, made it in. And, and there are a variety of books that you can read which will give you information on this. There's a series done by the teaching company that would tell you about that. In terms of the question of the armies and media, you make a good point there in the sense that it's very important if one wants to appreciate the, the rage that exists today, among Palestinians and in the Arab world, it's a sense of, you know, look at, at the disparity in terms of, 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 of arms and therefore in terms of the carnage that's taking place. So yes, suicide bombing, going into pizza parlors, killing non-combatants, that's terrorism, simply flat out. But it's also terrorism to go in and to, um, to kill uh, civilians in the ways that they've been, uh, in the, and to devastate uh, cities and towns. It's not enough to simply see them as collateral damage, that in fact violence and terror are taking place on both sides and that there is a disparity between the two in terms of their, their military power. And that's also part of what motivates suicide bombers who feel we don't have weapons to go, to go up against people that have missiles and Apache helicopters, etc., which they get from the U.S., and they turn themselves into a weapon. Unholy War is John Esposito's new book. He'll be with us for just five more minutes, but you are in, in the midst of a national press tour. On this. Yeah. Where are you visiting? Uh, going to, uh, to Boston, going to New York, uh, and then possibly the West Coast. Uh, I'm also going to be uh, going overseas. I have several overseas uh, trips as well. And is this available right now in bookstores? Yeah, well, it better be. <laughs> if it's not, Oxford's not doing its job. Next call for you is from San Diego. Good morning, caller. Good morning. I'm uh, going to run over and find out if the book's in the bookstore. I, I wish I went to Georgetown. I only went to a year of college, then I joined after uh, college uh, for a year into the Marine Corps, and then I went to the cops, and I look at it in a little different slant. I look at it in a slant where there's been an Israel for a long time, there's been a Palestine for a long time, and they've got to sit down together. And unfortunately, the two leaders that represent both of the countries don't want the peace. I don't see it. I'm a Catholic. I look at it on the side of the Pope, and that's the violence has to stop. You can't talk and have violence at the same time. As far as President Bush goes, I think he's doing a great job because he's stuck in the middle. Clinton was stuck in the middle. He took a side. I don't think it was the right side. I think basically a lot of the terrorism is a result of what side he took. And as far as that lady that called up without religion, boy, it must be pretty dark in her house. Caller, let me go back to your point that it's the leaders who don't want peace. Do you believe that the population as a whole does? You bet. I think if they sat down uh, and basically took the, the decent people, not the bombers. A bomber is like a New York criminal, for crying out loud. He's out for his own beautifulization or, or, or victimization or whatever you want to look at. it. Like I said, I'm looking at it from a cop's point of view. Somebody straps dynamite on their body. They may be saying that they're a martyr. They're out to blow up people. They did it in New York uh, with the PLO, uh, the, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the Puerto Rican Liberation Army. There's been so many people that have been saying, oh, we're fighting for such a cause, for such a cause. They're looking to blow up people and make a headline. Let's cut that baloney and just tell it like it is. The leaders have to be leaders that want peace. The people have to be the people that want peace. And the other people have to be locked up and put away. They're nothing but murderers. Now, as far as the soldiers go... Well, let me jump in just because time is running out. Thanks for calling. I think you make some very good points. Uh, you know, regrettably, what I have to say is whatever the merits of, of both leaders uh, have been uh, in the past, uh, both have, from my point of view, both have failed their people. Um, and uh, I think that's part of the difficulty of the peace process. You know, would that there were other leaders uh, in their place. Uh, as a result, both have put their people under siege. And as, as a result of that, you have more and more Israelis and Palestinians who wanted and opted for peace now feeling under siege, who both wind up, therefore, supporting a military solution. Next telephone call is from Spencer West. Sorry, first we're going to hear from uh, Springfield. Springfield, New Jersey, that is. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, I don't understand why the Palestinians aren't enraged over the country, the Arab countries that have so much money that never try to uh, raise their standard of living where they're living now. Why, uh, why don't the Palestinians feel that they weren't helped by their own people and were actually um, uh, uh, told to leave Jordan? Uh, why, why doesn't that enter into the, um, into the whole conflict? Well, I, think, I think two things. It's, it's, it's a very good observation. In fact, um, 
some of the oil countries have in the past uh, hired and also provided aid to the Palestinians. But the reality of it is the Palestinians have long felt that Arab rulers have not played the role that they could play, that they've had the leverage to play it. And if anything, uh, they've been uh, equally critical of, uh, of, of Arab, Arab, Arab rulers as they have at times of America in terms of foreign policy. Spencer, West Virginia, good morning to you. Uh, good morning. I was just calling about your comment about the difference between press coverage between Europe and America. I sometimes watch BBC News, and I know you're right. They do seem to be much more even-handed over there. Uh, you mentioned that it was an access problem, that the Israelis didn't let the reporters in, but it seems that given that American media is more Israeli-friendly, they would have more access. Um, the, why is there this big difference between Europe and America? And does it have anything to do with the overwhelmingly Jewish ownership in America of the mass media? I think, that, I think that the problem is twofold. It's an access issue, but it's also a bias issue. There's an excellent article in The Nation, which actually talks about you know, many of the major publications and many of the major commentators, and where do they really you know, come down? How do they tilt? The fact is, I've been, I've been following this for 30 years, and even as compared to the Gulf War, I, I have not seen such a lopsided uh, you know, approach uh, with regard to uh, coverage. So it's both, it's not just access, it's also bias. Having followed it for 30 years, were you surprised that September 11th happened? I wasn't, I, I, what I was surprised at was that it, it happened when it happened. But uh, having had in, what was it, 93, a World Trade Center bombing, uh, it, it, it wasn't, uh, it didn't surprise me, it wasn't inconceivable. But how it happened, the way it happened, I think I was as stunned as everybody else was. And what do you, how do you believe, based on your study of the governments and the cultures uh, that support them, that this is going to end up playing out in the near term? Well, I think that unless, this is where it really becomes important, unless both the U.S. and governments in the region address the root causes, uh, which I uh, talk about in, in the book, uh, unless those are really addressed uh, frontally, um, the, the simple fact of it is that extremism will grow. And define the root causes. Root causes are Arab-Israeli conflict, Iraqi sanctions, uh, what is regarded as a U.S. double standard when it comes to the promotion of democracy and human rights. It promotes it in one part of the world, but tends to be very slow to promote it with authoritarian regimes. Uh, the U.S. has to be careful. After 9-11, when we fight a war on terror, we bend the standards. As a result, Central Asian governments and many Arab governments have seen a green light to become even more repressive at home. Uh, those kinds of root causes, if not addressed, uh, that is both domestic issues as well as international issues, I think feed the growth of extremism. Poverty was not on the list you just mentioned. Oh, uh, poverty's there, but that's, that's part of the root causes that governments in the region need to address and the U.S. needs to be aware of. You've got a growing disparity between, uh, between uh, rich and poor, but it's primarily something that has to be addressed within Arab and Muslim countries. The U.S. can then uh, be involved in terms of foreign aid, as, as can Europe. Next telephone calls from Tulsa. Good morning. Uh, yes, in your book, have you gone back? Hello. Yes, sir. Hello. We can hear you. Oh, yes, in your book, have you gone back to the Ottoman Ottoman Empire with the uh, Islamic, when the Jews in 1947, Gaza State, there were 45,000 troops, and the um, Ottoman Empire, basically the rem remnants of it, brought said, "Okay, Palestinians, come out of Palestine, and when we defeat and completely wipe out the Jews." You can go back in, get the Jewish land, and have the land that you had. And what happened in that war, there were 45,000 troops that were Israelis and 650,000 Ottoman Empire troops that were mainly Islamic. And the 45,000 troops of Israel defeated the Islamics. And uh, that's kind of the history of it. And I don't think that the Islamic Empire has gotten over that, and they want to completely wipe out the Jewish Empire. That, that, that's absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, it's also fabricated history. Um, frankly, I've never, I've never heard this account of history or seen it. Um, one of the things you might want to remember is that uh, when uh, the Jews, as indeed the Muslims, were uh, run out of Andalusia or Spain, uh, 1492 and after that in succeeding centuries, uh, where the Jews went were North Africa and also went over to uh, and were uh, uh, welcomed by, um, by the uh, Ottoman em Empire. But the story that you've just told about uh, makes fascinating reading, uh, but uh, 
it's, it's a terrific fable. Coming to our own country, what uh, is important to know if there are any ties between the, the nation of Islam and the larger practices of, uh, of Muslim religion in the United States? Historically, the nation of Islam, uh, you know, split, and, and so you have the mainstream group under Warath Adin and then Farrakhan's group. And Farrakhan's group has always been uh, the more separatist, etc., uh, and, and not regarded as being part of mainstream Islam at all. In the last year or two, Farrakhan has said that he now sees his group and wants to bring it within mainstream Islam, or has. Whether or not that actually uh, is is uh, is the case can only be only time will tell. Washington D.C. Uh, yes, good, good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you addressed the uh, the glossy-eyed uh, view of history. Uh, the last caller uh, uh, commented. In fact, I'm, I'm very surprised that uh, many Americans see uh, see things uh, exactly the way in which he mentioned. Uh, but my question here, I'd first like to premise my question and comment by saying that uh, I am a Catholic. Uh, uh, I'm married to a, a Jewish woman, and uh, my question um, relates to the question of uh, the issue of uh, Israel, uh, the existence of Israel as a nation versus a, a Jewish state, uh, much to the exclusion of the uh, uh, Arabs uh, or Palestinians who were living there at the time, and your, your opinion on, on their right uh, to return. Well, I, I think that uh, my, my, my policy has always been very clear that the state of Israel and, and U.S. support for the state of Israel is, is, is absolute, that, the, that it, the state of Israel has an absolute right to existence, stability, and security. But at the same time, there needs to be the, an equal sense and commitment to that of a Palestinian state. In terms of the right of return, um, I think that, to put it literally, uh, would be very difficult to achieve today logistically, economically, demographically, etc. And indeed, uh, some leaders uh, within the uh, PNA itself, the Palestinian National Authority, uh, have in recent months raised the fact that the, the right of return has to be there, but that it has to be qualified and reinterpreted in terms of the realities of, uh, of, of the land and the realities of the 21st century. This is not 50 years ago. If you'd like to read more, we encourage you to find John Esposito's brand new book, Unholy War, published by Oxford Press. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Thank you. It's going to be a big book weekend on C-SPAN, on C-SPAN 2, a coverage of the Los Angeles Festival of the Books throughout the weekend. And on C-SPAN, we invite you to join us for American Writers, tonight, Ernest Hemingway at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And on Sunday, the profile of John Steinbeck and his writings about the American labor movement in California and the West in the 1930s and 40s. And also book notes this weekend, we'll be looking at the life of John Maynard Keynes and Keynesian economics and its uh, role in the United States. Uh, policy arena. As we close here, let me tell you about what's happening next. We're going to move from this discussion of, uh, uh, of the Muslim religion and politics that have resulted from it to domestic issues here at home. Right on Capitol Hill right now, a hearing has just begun, chaired by Senator Christopher Dodd of Connecticut. On